we are in. Okay, right now? Yes. Yes, early start, right? Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all the special guests and our friends from Digital Futures. It's a great honor uh, tonight uh, or today we invite uh, Archimangus here to join us in this special event. In the past two weeks, actually, New Leach and me, uh, we organized a PhD consortium for Digital Futures. And uh, uh, New uh, um, starting uh, organized the first session of the PhD consortium named Philosophy and the Architecture. And the second uh, sequence of lecture uh, is um, the topic on the guide line and the guide uh, to AI. And right now, um, I'm invited several professors out of the world coming to especially uh, uh, talking about the topic performance-based design, uh, digital design methodology. So this is the third day for the digital consortium PhD program. And this is a platform. Uh, actually, it is a new edition this year to our international uh, digital futures doctor program. Its principle follows this year's theme, inclusive futures, to build an inclusive and open forum for the doctor students all over the world to join and share ideas and further inspire each other. Actually, in the uh, uh, past few days, we invite uh, uh, more than 20 uh, PhD candidates and uh, making uh, lectures and exchange ideas uh, in different sessions. So that's a great um, experience. And uh, at the same time, we invited some um, prominent figures or uh, important architects from all over the world uh, to give lectures and uh, uh, exchange their um, uh, uh, new ideas um, and also showing some leading, um, uh, uh, leading, leading concepts from the architecture school and institutions. Many of them you have already heard in the past few weeks, actually. And this morning session, we invite Machie give a fantastic lecture to introduce his research and then tonight and uh, maybe uh, this afternoon time in Europe, we invited um, Archimangus from University of Stuttgart, uh, who actually, I think this is uh, six year for Achim coming to uh, join the digital future event. So great thanks for his support. And actually we have a PhD exchange student program and also um, you, uh, uh, Achim and me, we collaborate with each other and already do some pavilion uh, in Shanghai, in Shenzhen. So that's a fantastic experience from uh, those teams. So Achim, uh, Achim Mangus is a, a very special um, architect, a successful architect uh, in Frankfurt. And at the same time, he's a full professor at the University of Stuttgart, where he's founding director of ICD, uh, Institute for uh, Computational Design and Construction. And also he is a director of the Cluster of Excellence in integrative computational design and construction for architecture. In addition, he has been visiting professor in architecture at Harvard GSD for uh, I think more than seven years, right? And also he held multiple other visiting professorship in Europe and the States as well. He graduated from, um, he graduated with honors from the AA in London where he sequentially taught at, at uh, different studios. I think a uh, studio master and uh, unit master in AA graduate school and AA diploma school. And in the past few years, uh, Akim is famous for the pavilion culture, actually, uh, not only in AA, but also after he moving to uh, Stuttgart. Uh, every year, we're looking forward to see uh, what uh, ICD and Akim Angus put forward as a, a special avant-garde uh, to showing the digital fabrication pavilion to the world. So today it's a great honor for us to invite Ahim to give a lecture to um, all of us. Actually, uh, we have a Bidi uh, stream live, um, uh, uh, live stream and also YouTube as well. We have uh, thousands of audience. So it's a great honor for all of us to uh, participate to this special event. So thank you. I want to uh, uh, give the, uh, the crane to Ahim. So would you please share screen?
Okay, we can see it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Philip, for uh, your kind words of introduction. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure uh, to be back at Digital Futures. Um, as you mentioned, we have been collaborating for a long time and uh, we are very happy to uh, give two workshops uh, as part of the Inclusive Futures event. And I'm um, also very happy to uh, give this uh, lecture um, right now um, as part of the uh, performance-based digital design methodologies um, part. So um, as uh, you mentioned, um, this, is, this section is particularly uh, focused on performance-based design um, methodologies. And this is also a bit the kind of uh, emphasis and focal point um, of my lecture um, on integrative computational design and construction. Um, but I think it's also important, and that's the subtitle, that this is alluding to a novel material culture in architecture and is trying to sort of build the methodological foundations for that. Um, I think, uh, let me just see whether I can get this to run. Um, yes. So um, the research we are doing at the University of Stuttgart is very much concerned with the kind of uh, two notions of computation and materialization. And this is also, uh, let's say, the two key aspects around which this talk will revolve. And in particular, we are interested in how computation allows us to rethink materialization in architecture. Um, I think this is uh, really important um, because I think we are experiencing uh, a situation um, in our discipline where really the kind of possibilities are dramatically expanded through computation but it requires also um, substantially or a kind of profound shift in the way we think about design. And this is something that I will talk about a bit. Um, I think uh, it's also important to say that um, this sort of interest in naturalization is something that of course has a long history, particularly let's say in Central Europe and also at the University of Stuttgart. And this is um, a kind of history that we built on. So in many ways, we are trying to um, also question the traditional um, hierarchy um, that of course has been predominant in architectural um, design and architectural discourse, um, which prioritizes form um, over material, materialization, materiality, structure. So um, I think there are many interesting precedents who began questioning this already in the 20th century. One of the key figures, of course, is uh, Joseph Albers, who you can see here with one of his seminal paper studies that he conducted as part of the four course he taught at the Bauhaus in Dessau. Um, this picture is actually a bit later already at the Black Mountain College. But regardless, I think what is important to understand is that, and this is, in, this is really uh, of great importance, is that the model that we're looking at here is not a typical architectural model. It is not the representation of an idea, but it's the generator for an idea that is actually conceived through the experimentation with the material itself. In this case, a folded paper, which at the same time generates form and structure. I think along the similar lines, um, we are uh, also of course, feel very much um, related to the work that Fry Otto did at his institute at the University of Stuttgart, which really established a whole catalog of design methodologies um, that revolved around the notion of form finding, where he explored for various different material systems, how you can really give material an agency from which you can actually derive and generate um, a design rather than the other way around. You come up with a design and you look at um, the materiality and its materialization um, as a kind of second step of problem solving. So um, it is within those kind of uh, footsteps that we try to pursue our work. But of course, um, looking at it from a different angle, primarily through the lens of computation but also um, from a different context in which we find ourselves. 
I think it's important to say that um, we're experiencing a kind of material crisis in architecture. And I think this material crisis, which is expressed in the fact that the building sector is responsible for approximately 40% of global research consumption, generates more than 50% of global waste. So a serious threat to the future of our planet. And um, that is, I would say, also um, a result or I'd say um, a symptom of uh, the kind of uh, lack of the design methods that we are currently um, actually using um, to address these issues. So one aspect that we are looking at in particular is how we can actually reduce the consumption of materials um, because this will be the problem that we're really facing in the next 20 years. If you look at um, this uh, uh, two um, diagrams here on the right, you can see that for the building construction that will happen, the new construction in 2015 and 2050, um, the kind of assumption that most of the energy goes actually into building operations um, really needs to be questioned, where some data shows that um, building sector CO2 emissions, for example, are originating up to 90% in the building materials. So most of the CO2 is already emitted before you actually um, inhabit the building for the first time. If you look at more advanced, um, let's say, uh, construction, such as the passive house, typical residential buildings here in Central Europe, you can see that already now, more than 60% uh, um, is spent on the materialization of the building, actually 47%, almost half on building construction, and another 17% on the building refurbishment during its lifetime on only 36% goes into operation. So those are the buildings that are already there. And this will um, this shift towards that kind of uh, um, problem of the material materiality and the materialization of buildings um, will become uh, bigger and bigger year by year. So um, this is something uh, we aim to address by, in the end, just building with a lot less material. Um, that's the simple, let's say, um, aspect that we need to address. And of course, we are also interested in using digital technologies um, in order to get there. But I think when we talk about digital technologies, it's also important um, to understand that they really require a fundamental shift in the way we think about design. And um, this is one of my favorite quotes here by Sanford Quinter, um, who rightly asks that one of the great pitfalls um, that uh, many architects and designers fall into is that they think that digital technologies exist as a kind of linear extension of pre-digital approaches. And I think this is something we really need to address, not only because the construction sector is um, of course one of the still one of the least digitalized um, industry sectors um, of all, as you can nicely see here, um, falling behind even agriculture, forestry, and fishing. But it's also because the way that digital technologies are currently employed um, is very much a kind of computerization of the design, engineering, fabrication, and construction processes that we already know. So um, what we see here is the typical aim of such a kind of uh, digital approach is the kind of uh, digital chain. Um, but if we really look into this, each kind of link in this chain um, is in a sense, um, just a kind of extension of how we have designed, fabricated and constructed before. So um, one good example is building information modeling, um, which is still based on a kind of understanding that what we need to model is actually the product. Yeah? So not the process how we get there. So in a sense, um, it is not on the traditional geometric notational forms that we have, although they are now linked to a database that enriches the notation 
with inf uh, additional information and attributes. But in many ways, it is a digital design approach that is set up um, to address primarily pre-digital building approaches. Similarly, if you look at uh, a lot of uh, work that is going on into how you can actually construct using digital technologies, such as the example of FastBricks Robotics here, and we see that the main aim is to automate um, the construction with building systems that we already know. So I think um, in many ways, it is the automated construction for pre-digital building systems, as is probably most emblematic when you actually build a brick house with one of those advanced on-site robots, because in the end, um, the brick is probably one of the best examples of a building system that was designed, or let's say more culturally evolved to be actually laid by hand, not only in its kind of dimensions, um, weight, um, but also in the kind of ideas for how you compensate for tolerances, uh, et cetera. So in many ways, um, what we see um, in those kind of projects are digital technologies for pre-digital design and construction. And what we are trying to do is to understand how we can overcome this situation, how we can think of digital technologies to um, require a kind of positively disruptive approach um, that is based on a much higher level of integration. And that's what I would like to talk about um, today. Um, integrative computation design and construction approaches that really tap into the full potential of te digital technologies, um, primarily through this notion of integration. Um, of course, when we talk about integration, um, we need to understand that what it is really about is that we don't no, no longer seek innovation, isolated innovation in one of those bubbles. So no longer just try to push design methods or engineering methods, no longer just look at fabrication and construction processes or material and building systems. But what is really required is that we look at all those aspects at the same time and in constant feedback with each other. And this is where um, digital technologies can really allow us to do the next step and reach that much higher level of integration. Um, when we talk about integration, of course, there's one fantastic model um, where you would never actually disentangle what are, let's say, design in quotation mark methods, what are the processes of materialization, and what are the material systems that stem from it. Um, uh, and that is, of course, living nature. In nature, form, structure, material, and performance, as well as the becoming of those material structures is inherently and inseparably related. And you would never even have the idea to try to sort of separate those aspects. But that's exactly what we're doing um, in architecture and building construction. So um, as a side effect, um, of this, biology is also a lot more economic with the materials. Um, and I think this is also a very, very important aspect that um, in, in biological structures, we find a kind of inherent way to address a certain economy with the materials. And that's somehow exactly what we require in architecture, as I mentioned before. So um, in a nutshell, one can say that in biology, material is expensive, but shape is cheap. And as of today, the opposite was true in the case of technology, and in particular, in the case of the technologies that we employ, where we always sacrificed um, a reduction of materials um, or a kind of being economic with the materials uh, for being economic with the processes of construction which sort of prioritize the simple um, yet wasteful over um, the intricate and complex yet performative. So um, this is the situation that we are interested in addressing. And uh, we think that uh, what is 
the critical methodological step in this direction is what we like to call co-design. Co-design relates to that we are actually really needing to design the relationships from between design and engineering methods, fabrication and construction processes, and the related material building systems together and in constant feedback. And we need to design from scratch. So um, this may sound a bit academic, um, but it's something that we have pursued, not just as a kind of, uh, let's say, research agenda for the last 10 years, but we have also all been um, very keen on showing how they actually then result in a kind of novel um, architectural expression. And in that way, begin to um, allude to an emerging novel material culture that actually is addressing also this material crisis that we're facing. So um, what I will do in this talk um, is explaining a little bit this uh, key methodology of co-designing um, material and uh, uh, sort of co-designing the um, building and material systems, the construction and fabrication processes, the design methods and how they relate to um, the biological uh, role models along three case studies. One case study is focused on segmented timber shells and goes uh, back to 2014 um, and will sort of indicate a bit of a kind of lineage of how this work has evolved over the last seven years. Um, I will also talk about uh, fiber composite structures um, by uh, introducing um, three examples actually. Um, one from 2016, the Elytra Filament Pavilion, one from 2019, the Buga Fiber Pavilion, and now also our recent structure at the Venice Biennale, where we looked at how we can actually turn those fiber structures into truly inhabitable spaces. And um, the third uh, case study will focus on material programming, um, which is sort of the next level of co-designing methods processes and systems um, because they become sort of uh, part and parcel of one and the same um, approach. So let's start with uh, the first um, case study, um, which looks at the integrative computation design and construction of segmented timber shells. Um, as I mentioned, this has been a journey uh, for many years, um, which for the first time actually uh, came to an architectural um, preliminary result um, in 2014 with the Landesgartenschau Exhibition Hall, um, which was the first moment of convergence of a number of research projects um, through this uh, building um, that we constructed for the Landesgartenschau 2014. What it really is about is exploring how new manufacturing technologies allow us to understand very traditional and actually local, naturally renewable materials um, from a different perspective. So we were interested in seeing how um, a synthesis of those two things, uh, sort of the advanced manufacturing and the um, timber as a, a regional resource, especially also in the area around Stuttgart, where we actually have these two things, you know, advanced manufacturing technologies and a lot of forest, um, how they actually allow for conceptualizing um, and developing novel timber systems. And one of those um, that uh, I would like to explain a bit more are the segmented um, timber plates. So here the idea is that you use digital technologies to embed all the intelligence in this um, sort of tectonic system um, in the material itself. So um, the plate is considered to be not just, um, let's say, the surface material, but it's at the same time the connector. It is the joint. No further actually fasteners are required. It is a three-dimensional puzzle that you can actually um, uh, uh, sort of erect in space um, with force and form-fitting joints. So if you want to do this, um, on an architectural scale, of course, uh, you need to have a performance-oriented design methodology um, because those joints, of course, have 
certain disadvantages, namely that they are not very good in taking actually tension or bending moments. So um, what was really interesting is that this is of course, um, could be considered as a kind of conceptual problem from an engineering point of view. But then if we look at nature, we can find that there are actually natural systems such as um, some sea urgents who are also made from polygonal plates um, and still are able to actually, uh, uh, let's say, result in a, a really high performance shell structure, um, despite the fact that also their connections um, have the same supposed weaknesses as ours. So if you have a connection that can only take um, shear forces at the plate edge, um, or primarily shear and compression forces, hardly any tension um, and hardly any bending, um, you need to resolve um, basically this assumed deficiency through the, uh, in quotation mark, intelligence of the overall system. And this is what nature has evolved in this case. Um, and uh, it is interesting to see that this still works for a jointing system that is very, very similar to ours, as you can see here on the right, which is basically zoomed in onto the edge of one of those plates um, that shows that uh, nature here actually constructs its plate skeleton, particularly equivalent of our robotically uh, uh, fabricated um, finger joint plates. So um, we had several projects with uh, partners from the University of Tübingen, uh, biologists, in order to understand um, the principles that govern this performative um, behavior of the related sea urgent shells. Uh, and then we embedded this into um, a specific design method. Um, and this design method is an agent-based um, method. Um, this was actually the first time that we did this and we now have uh, developed these kind of agent systems for also almost a decade uh, and are about to launch them finally um, as a kind of publicly available uh, package um, because we're now confident that they really work um, in, in as a kind of general format. Um, but what we did here is that um, actually each agent um, is a plate and the plate navigates in space to find a position that complies with um, the uh, biomimetic design principles. And at the same time, um, make sure that uh, each blade is coherent with the manufacturing constraints. So the materialization is considered to be a driver in the form generation process, not something that you have to post rationalize into the structure. And what is really important, it still is a kind of uh, open-ended design approach. So what you can see here just uh, at this very moment is that designer can still interact with each agent. So you can actually pick a plate, move it, um, and then um, the <clears throat> agent system takes care of all the kind of uh, complex reciprocities that go far beyond what we can sort of a process with our minds. So in the end, uh, the agent-based design system integrates the kind of geometric constraints, the structure and joint behavior. We have now also integrated life cycle analysis and life cycle costing um, possibilities. Um, and it outputs um, the fabrication data, which can then directly uh, communicate with the machine, which in those uh, days in 2013 and 14 was um, a, a KUKA robot that we were actually, uh, that we had uh, uh, been given from KUKA to conduct this pro project, which is a kind of self-correcting um, robot that measures tolerances in its gear gears and then compensates for that in real time. Um, with this technology, it is possible to achieve the um, accuracy that we require for such a structure, because in the end, this force and form fitting joint only works if you have sub-millimeter tolerances, which was verified um, 
in this project over many cycles. So we had many, many scanning episodes for each element um, before actually the plate went onto the robot, uh, then after fabrication immediately when it left the facilities of the manufacturer when it was actually installed. And now we still scan the building every year. Um, and it was really interesting to see that um, despite the fact that we are building here with beech wood, which is a hardwood that is very sensitive to uh, moisture changes in the uh, ambient conditions, um, it really worked out that the structure, the load bearing structure could be assembled similar to a three-dimensional puzzle. What you can also see here is that um, the load bearing structure is incredibly thin. So um, the plates are only 50 millimeters strong. Uh, as you can see here, so it's a minimal thickness. Um, and uh, of course, this being a permanent building, it also needed to be equipped with insulation um, and uh, also a water barrier, which was all prefabricated. The whole building was actually um, prefabricated in three weeks and then set up on site in eight days. Um, and at the end, uh, on the out, side you can see um, this sort of cladding um, which is also made from wood um, which of course is in this case just the cladding but on the inside the architecture surface that also um, let's say uh, really has an architectural impact on the space celebrates this novel timber system and also its geometric adaption from kind of uh, Synclastic dome like configuration where you have the polygons that you know from football um, towards, uh, for example, an anti classic situation. And you can see in the foreground um, where the main space is actually uh, divided from the foyer, um, uh, where the plates, in order to remain planar, have to fold in and create this sort of uh, butterfly line. Um, so, in a way, um, this is a very, I think, authentic architecture. Um, that celebrates the material and the structure as the kind of uh, generator of the spatial qualities and also the um, spatial expression. At the same time, um, it's also interesting to see that it leads to a truly uh, resource effective building. So here we managed to build um, uh, a space of 605 cubic meters using just 12 cubic meters a foot. Um, so it's a, a 1 to 50 ratio of spatial and material volume. Um, and we used almost all of the materials because any offcuts from these more than 200 different uh, shapes of blades were actually designed to be pr processed into the hardwood flooring, which you can see here on the left. So um, I think it's a good example of how an architecture can be, I think, somehow evocative and expressive while being efficient and um, uh, uh, also effective at the same time. It is definitely an effective structure. If you consider that it spans 10 meters, has a structure thickness of 50 millimeters, which means that it is actually half the thickness of an eggshell, although we're scaling up, which of course means that um, the forces increase exponentially. One other aspect that is really important to us, and it was already very important to us in 2014, is that we are only employing regional resources. So already then we made sure that all the trees, all the wood that was actually used and processed for the building stems from, uh, or is actually grown and processed within a 200 kilometer radius. And um, that all the actually knowledge that contributes to the building um, uh, is sort of from a region of around 100 kilometers around the site. Um, with us being in Stuttgart, the Ulm and Kuka robots being produced uh, uh, in Augsburg. So um, that is also, of course, of great uh, socioeconomic relevance because it's a truly uh, so, uh, uh, regional value chain. And I think as a result, we get a truly regional building, although it may actually challenge our understanding of what a regional architecture really is. So um, to um, 
go to the next step in this journey, um, I want to show you a project that we uh, uh, finalized uh, or completed uh, two years ago, 2019, uh, for the Bundesgartenschau, um, which is the result of another five years of research across several research projects um, that we conducted in the meantime. And then we somehow were, uh, uh, had the chance or were commissioned to actually build this building in less than 13 months. So from the first uh, push of the button to the opening of this uh, exhibition, it was only um, 13 months, but we were still able um, to really push our research um, to realize this uh, much larger timber shell. So this is now a shell that has a clear span of 30 meters. Um, it sits in this expressive landscape of the Bundesgartenschau. Actually, also the landscape was digitally derived and digitally produced with a, a, um, a kind of digitally controlled digger, um, which was really interesting. Um, and uh, it is a, a kind of expression of um, how far we can now push um, this uh, novel uh, um, building system of segmented um, timber shells. So um, this building, of course, also had a function. Um, it served as a kind of event venue uh, for several hundred people. So it did not only require to have this kind of clear span, but it also had to have very good acoustics, which we accomplished um, despite the fact that this is a truly lightweight and primarily synclastic shell. Um, so our aim when we uh, embarked on uh, this endeavor was to say, okay, five years later, we need to be able to build three times the span using no more material um, than we consumed in 2014 for the 11 meter span, which of course is a bit increased the span, uh, the uh, sort of loads increase um, exponentially, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, of course, also the surface or the area covered by the shell um, increases um, sixfold. So here on this slide, you can already see that we um, uh, managed to uh, somehow address this challenge um, because the Landesgartenschau uh, requires 36.8 kilograms per square meter of wood um, and the Bundesgartenschau uh, does require only a little bit less, but as I mentioned, it spans almost 30, almost 30 meters. So how, how was that possible? I think there are two key aspects. One is that we really um, further developed the uh, performance-oriented design methodologies by having a much higher level of integration between the agent-based design approach and the structural evaluation. So the feedback is now a lot tighter and we were actually able to exploit um, situations that were considered to be initially structurally disadvantageous, such as the S-shaped um, perimeter of the shell, which in the end can be actually utilized to balance um, the structure. Um, so that is one part. And the other part is that we um, did something that is very counterintuitive and something that we never do in practice, and that is that we said we sacrifice the simplicity of building something from solid material um, by investing more effort in the fabrication process um, by turning what was previously a solid plate system now into a hollow plate or a hollow cassette system, but sort of uh, uh, accepting that that means that the complexity of making it increases significantly. So um, you can imagine that uh, in the kind of triple context, um, it would be very difficult to convince a client to say what used to be one building element is in our design now eight or 10 elements, but we were able to do this and to propose um, this more complex yet more performative and actually a lot more a resource and material efficient structure um, because we could, uh, let's say, compensate the addition effort with digital technologies. And I will come to that in a second. So just one word about this holocaustate system. So these are now hollow plates, as you can see here. 
um, the upper two layers are more or less the kind of facade panel and the battens and the waterproofing. And below that is the actual cassette, which has a top plate of 33 millimeters. Then this is glued with a structural glue joint to a ring beam. Um, and then that again is glued onto a bottom plate that's only 21 millimeters thick. So um, in many ways, um, this is possible because we co-designed the fabrication process with the building system and the actual building project. Um, I think it's a really, really good example of what we mean by co-design because we literally developed the fabrication technology as we developed the building proposal. So um, this is based on what we call platform-based uh, timber manufacturing. So we look at developing one platform that can actually address all tasks required to complete one of those hollow cassettes in a fully automated manner. Um, and this um, in a way that the platform itself is actually, um, let's say, location independent. So our idea was to uh, develop a mobile factory, which you can see here, which sits on an ISO um, standard container platform. So that means you can ship it anywhere, by truck, by ship, uh, however you like, and that then can be deployed um, to build the building, either to prefabricate it offsite, but theoretically also um, to be deployed onsite. So here um, is how you can see that. It's a very compact uh, manufacturing unit that we could ship to any timber manufacturer. Um, and here you can see how the elements are built. So this is the bottom plate being applied. Then the glue is applied. Now you can see the rim beam being actually assembled. Um, this is held in place by timber nails that are shot into the rim beams. Now a layer of glue is applied. Then the top plate is added, uh, it goes onto the stack and it starts over again with the bottom plate, automatic glue application, um, the rim beams, the glue, uh, the, the timber nails, just for fixing so that they don't slide around um, in the process of drying um, and then the top plate being um, applied. So um, this was video was a bit accelerated in real time. It takes around seven minutes on average to build one of those cassettes. Um, then um, the cassettes actually are in the stack and need to be uh, pressed and then come back into the same manufacturing unit uh, machined. And here we were very, very careful in um, uh, sort of laser scanning again, uh, the accuracy of each element and we reached a kind of mean deviation from the uh, target accuracy of only 0.35 millimeters. So in a sense, it's phenomenal uh, high precision, um, but it's also required because only then you can make sure that the forces properly travel um, through these joints. So this means that uh, we get the main advantage out of the building system. And that is that you can build the shell without requiring any scaffold. If you think about uh, shell structures, they have always been very performative. And there are many examples of super thin, super high performance shell structures in the 20th century, but they all um, vanished, let's say, from the palette of what we can build with because they are too labor intensive, because they require an incredibly elaborate false work to actually be built, being built. So here we don't need this because the structure is on the one hand, very lightweight. And on the other hand, it is also um, uh, uh, very precise so that we can really build it up like a three-dimensional puzzle from three edges going up um, until you get the um, keystone in at the end. Uh, and this is the way this shell was actually constructed. Um, and here you can see it um, uh, again. I think it's a very authentic um, high performance architecture where even the illumination just celebrates the hollow cassettes. So everything you can see here is actually um, contributing to the structure performance.
but it does so in a way that it also um, adds a certain level of expression and architectural quality um, that I think alludes to also a kind of different way of working with the materials, a different and novel material culture. Um, I think it was really nice to see how, despite the uh, horrendous timeline of the project, everything quite literally came together very nicely um, in this project. And especially that um, this place was actually used uh, almost 24 hours um, during the um, Bundesgartenschau uh, uh, show, um, primarily for concerts, as you can see here, where we're very happy that um, uh, um, Dichelle also provided uh, exceptional acoustics, mainly because it uh, limits reverberation times geometrically, not by mass. Um, and I think it's another indicator how you can actually use I would say it's almost like an ancient principle that you find in a lot of uh, Persian music chambers. So for example, Isfahan um, that is deployed here um, to deal with the acoustics, um, despite the fact that there's a kind of lack of mass. There's a small video that uh, summarizes the project. This is the agent-based model that you can see working, including all details, all bolts, all connections. Okay, um, so what is interesting maybe to note is that this building was designed from the beginning to be a circular building. So you can reuse the entire building once it is actually taken down uh, from this temporary site. And we're currently um, basically um, designing um, the next uh, location for it, which will be permanent, uh, just uh, about hundred kilometers away from where it is now. And we will be reset up and used as a kind of permanent event space, also equipped with a glass facade so that it can really be a space that you can use uh, all year round. So I think it's the best possible case when it comes to recycling and circular economy is, of course, when you can recycle your entire building and use it somewhere else. And uh, I think this is what we're trying to show here as well. Um, other parts uh, where uh, we will want to go next is, of course, that uh, it is important that um, those 
building systems uh, and related co-design approaches find their way into practice. This is, for example, a competition proposal um, that we uh, unfortunately only won the second place with for um, the Expo Pavilion uh, for Dubai 2020, um, where our idea was to say that, okay, we can actually ship the factory to Dubai and build the whole building on site and then actually also as a legacy plan, take this whole building um, again away and set it up somewhere else. So everything was designed to be fully reusable. Um, as I said, unfortunately, we only got to the, uh, in this competition, made the second place, but the, nevertheless, I think it was a really um, good experience. Um, other uh, projects that we're uh, currently pursuing is to see how we can use these very lightweight systems um, as a, a very good opportunity to extend existing building stock. This is a project we have been working on for quite some time um, to build a building on top of an existing actually parking lot. Um, that is a typical situation that you find in Germany. So with the changes of mobility, a lot of those parking lots become um, a, a lot less used. Um, and here there's an inner city space um, that can actually be not built on with any other material system because the, this parking lot uh, or parking garage uh, very economically built. This one actually was built in 1960s and already extended once in the year 2000. And now we can add two more layers, which of course, again, has also social cultural implications because you relieve a bit of the pressure on inner city, uh, um, <clears throat> let's say sites um, to contribute something to the whole community as this was designed to be a kind of gym. Um, finally, of course, uh, these systems are also um, very interesting if you want to build uh, really large uh, structures. The lightweightness um, can be fully uh, exploited the larger the span. Um, so um, this is an example where we designed a kind of research facility that had a roof that spans, I think, almost 30 meters by 130 meters. So this is also one of the next steps that we want to um, take in, in regards to applying those systems in the real world. Um, one other uh, outlook in terms of research when it comes to the timber structures that uh, in our new cluster of excellence, we now want to also make the step of uh, going from, let's say, the roof structures of shells towards multi-story timber buildings and look at how the co-design of um, methods, processes, and systems can be applied here. So um, in our cluster, we have actually 10 projects that just look at multi-story buildings. Um, some at the cores, which we consider to be probably made from uh, functionally graded concrete, um, mainly because of, let's say, uh, fire issues. But then uh, we explore um, how we can actually uh, develop kind of from scratch new multi-story wood building systems, um, also biocomposite uh, materials for, for example, panels and cladding. Um, how we um, can conceptualize related uh, cyber physical um, fabrication platforms, which have begun to develop in the Buga project and now want to take to the next level of conceiving of entire flexible factories. Um, we also look at how that requires from a, a sociological point of view, a reconfiguration of training skills and literacy, um, the related data processing challenges um, and data integration challenges. Uh, and finally, also, of course, um, an important architectural, historical, and social reflection. So I think there will be a lot of really exciting research coming out of those projects um, uh, in the next few years. Um, in the cluster, we also explore uh, radically different ways of constructing, um, such as uh, with distributed robotics. So how can you build a timber building not using really heavy machinery, but exploiting the lightweightness of the materials itself by having many, many small robots that actually utilize the building material as part of their kinematic chain. So this is what you can see here is the idea that you want to replace the robot and integrate the material into the robot itself so that um, machine and material form a new kind of unity in the construction process, um, which actually means that you can build with a lot less expensive um, machinery um, with a lot more agile machines, 
Um, and of course, you can do this in a very parallel fashion, as you can see here. So there are many, um, let's say, research challenges with that. Um, we are investigating, for example, the task and motion planning um, with colleagues uh, from uh, robotics and especially also artificial intelligence approaches in doing this in a kind of adaptive way um, so that in the end, you are able also to build such structures by actually having stating a performance goal and not necessarily offering a blueprint of how the final system should look like. Here you can see the connections. This was a kind of drilling add-on to the robot. And then here's some first ideas of how this may actually play out in terms of uh, functionally graded structures and a lot of new possibilities that arise if you work with timber in this way. Um, yeah, here you can see how the robots can walk and deliver elements to different parts. And uh, this is actually the first generation of robots. We now have the second one, um, which actually work uh, a lot better. And I think we'll be uh, hopefully able to also demonstrate that at the beginning of next year in a larger structure that will follow on on this uh, fantastic uh, thesis project that we had <coughs> a couple of years ago. So with that, um, I would like to come to my second case study. Um, which is somehow on the other end of the spectrum when it comes to the, uh, let's say, employed materials. So while we just looked at timber, which is arguably one of the oldest and also uh, very often used construction materials, now here we want to see how co-design cool allows also to deal with some of the materials that have not even been uh, uh, used um, very much in our uh, let's say in architecture and construction. Um, and this is um, carbon fiber and glass fiber. So of course, these materials really challenge our understanding of what building material. Instead of being solid and heavy, those materials are actually filamentous. They are very strong in one direction, very weak in the other direction. Um, they are very soft before they are cured, but when they are cured, they are stronger and stiffer in relation to their weight than steel. Um, what is also interesting to note is that in biology, almost all load-bearing structures are actually made from fibers. Um, and the way that uh, nature capitalizes on the specific, let's say, characteristics of the fibers is, of course, um, a great, let's say, reference um, when it comes to a great role model um, and the kind of pool of principles that you can tap into when designing for such um, a kind of novel material system in architecture. This is something I would also like to show with a few projects and I will accelerate here a little bit. Um, so um, the first project um, in which we were able to the Elytra filament pavilion that we constructed uh, for the Victorian Albert Museum in 2016. Here, this was um, that we won with our proposal for uh, a kind of shelter that um, protects um, the 4 million visitors that actually inhabit this courtyard per year um, with a very lightweight structure that um, does not uh, um, actually touch the ground very heavily, nor does it, uh, um, let's say, have a major impact on the surroundings, um, primarily because we were able to propose a super lightweight system um, based on a number of years of research, uh, exploring the possibilities of such fibrous tectonics. So here you can see the pavilion in one of the states um, uh, um, that it took. Um, I will come back to that later. Um, but I think one, one advantage that we had when proposing this project was that we could tap into multiple years of research on sort of high performance and natural composite systems. And one of the most fascinating ones you can see here, which is the uh, four wing of uh, flying beetles, which you can see in this circle. So that's the hardened four wing that in some of the ground beetles that you can see on the left in this microscopic cross section is actually a solid plate. But for flying beetles, it is a very intricate, super lightweight fiber structure 
that is made from um, chitin fibers that are embedded in a protein matrix. So we were able to analyze um, various kinds of flying beetles uh, using this, um, uh, uh, basically it's kind of mega scale computer tomography machine, a particle accelerator um, at the University of Karlsruhe, which allowed us to scan um, those elytra um, uh, with uh, a kind of resolution of a few micron. So this comparative study uh, revealed somehow um, how the nature achieves such a high level of performance on the one hand, but also how it can build with one and the same building systems, very different situations as you can see here. So on the upper image, you can see a kind of, I would say relatively regular shell structure, but on the lower image, you can see how nature builds almost a kind of a slab that sits between a wall and a, uh, and a support point. And on the other hand, there's a huge cantilever. So all kinds of different situations for which we would typically find different solutions in architecture. But here nature resolves everything within one material system. And one of the key principles of that material system is that all the fibers are continuous between the upper layer and the lower layer of this double layered structure. So this is what you can nicely see here, how in the kind of microscopic section, the layers are going from the upper layer to the lower layer and that without actually being disrupted or broken or jointed. So this is um, the fundamental principle that we took on to develop our building system, which consists now not no longer of chitin fibers, but of carbon fibers and glass fibers, which are also continuous and made from one endless fiber um, that regularly oscillates between the upper and the lower surface. Um, that at the same time allowed us to overcome one of the main obstacles for um, composite construction uh, on a larger scale, and that is the need for molds. So here you see the mold for a wind turbine plate, and you get the idea that if you want to build a mold on this scale, um, you have to actually use it many, many, many times in order to um, get a return on this initial investment. So very different to that, we built a very simple scaffold, actually not a mold, just a scaffold with a few anchor points and the form of the uh, component is actually generated by the fibers it themselves as the equilibrium state that they take in the fabrication process. Again, sounds pretty complicated, but it's in the end quite simple. Um, so here you can see those uh, elements uh, in our lab, we built more than 40 of them um, in our lab. Here you can also see that, of course, here fabrication, structure, and material, and the architectural expression are intrinsically related. And here you can see how the, this, um, let's say, temporary scaffold that is made from steel um, is used to apply the fibers um, initially the white fibers and then the black carbon fibers that you can see here um, and how, let's say, between the scaffold, the actual component emerges initially in the shape of the glass fibers and then with the carbon fibers being applied exactly where you need them. So with one and the same tool, you can actually build an infinite number of highly differentiated, highly loaded, load adapted um, elements. This is what you can see here. So um, here we see one of the medium apertures. You can see that at the upper edge, there's more material at the lower edge, there's less material, probably because the cantilevers in this direction. And that means that we can actually uh, um, <clears throat> achieve uh, incredibly lightweight, incredibly materially efficient uh, elements um, where each fiber is based um, or the placement of each fiber is based on an intricate structural analysis that anticipates the overall performance as well as the kind of local performance of the place. Um, what is also important is that, of course, if you have building elements that only weigh around nine kilograms per square meter, and if you the only thing that you need to build them is a small tent, uh, a compact manufacturing unit like the robot, a few liters of resin and a few, lit a few kilograms of material, 
then you can really think about local production. And not just local production, but ongoing construction. So what we did here is that we said, we don't want to design the building and then we go to a building phase and then we end the construction phase and then the use phase starts, but all these phases are blurred. And in that way, the pavilion becomes an adaptive space that can dynamically evolve in relation to how visitors use it. So what we did is we monitored the way that uh, actually um, people inhabit the space um, and then change, extend and sort of rebuild and build additional elements um, in order to have the pavilion evolve um, together or in feedback with the way it is actually inhabited. For this, um, we uh, monitored the uh, environmental conditions, uh, many different uh, uh, temperature, wind speed, uh, et cetera, um, to uh, basically calculate the universal thermal climate index. And we related that to the movement patterns of space and habitation, which we registered, of course, entirely anonymously. Um, at the same time, um, we of course face the challenge that if you want to reconfigure your building and you don't design an engineering for a particular end state, you need to make sure that also your structural model can update um, or even better that your structure can sense the forces and experience and communicate that back to the digital model. And that's exactly what we did here because the fibers can not only be the load bearing structure, they can also be through fiber optics, the sensors with which you can actually monitor the forces. So this even convinced a very uh, tough and uh, uh, um, structural proof engineer that the VMA specifically appointed for the project, which meant that we could go through various cycles of reconfiguration um, and continuous fabrication and construction on site, which meant that the structure actually changed during the exhibition um, a, a couple of times. So here you can see um, the roof elements. And I think uh, it becomes obvious that it is really a kind of convergence of architectural expression, structural efficiency, um, fabrication, traces uh, of the fabrication that relate or result in an architectural system really novel and innovative, but on the other hand, is also very authentic because it communicates how it is made and what it does, I think, in a very direct fashion. So as I mentioned, the, the, the structure has not a single piece of steel in it. It is just fibers. The entire roof, which is around 200 square meters in the initial state, weighs a, a little bit more than two tons, which means that it is 100 times larger in a masonry structure that you can see here in the background. Um, so um, I think it is, it, for us, it was a fantastic project that raised also all kinds of questions of how we can take this um, further and uh, ability to showcase uh, subsequent years of research um, at the Bundesgartenschau um, with uh, this pavilion um, that you can see here also embedded into this expressive landscape, um, but at the other end of this island, um, so, to, so to say, uh, on the opposite uh, end of this boulevard um, from the um, timber field. So um, here the brief was uh, to design an as transparent um, space as possible that would house uh, one specific exhibit, which we didn't design, uh, but uh, which actually communicated um, digital technologies to the visitors. Um, um, and in many ways, we try to uh, basically provide the architectural context for this exhibition. Um, so in this project, uh, we aim having an even simpler manufacturing process. So we change from this uh, scaffold, the metal scaffold um, uh, that uh, generates these kind of plate-like elements 
to um, an, a lot simpler scaffold that only exists at the two ends of uh, what turned out to be a kind of tubular element um, for this structure. So here you can see this, um, it's, it's um, those two tools that look like the kind of mouth of a crocodile or two crocodiles. Um, there's a central axis that is only there because um, only one of those positions is actually active. The other one is passively rotating with the other one. And then the glass fiber net is applied on this scaffold. And through that, the shape of the component is generated. And on the glass fibers, very selectively, only where you need it, the carbon fibers are applied, which leads to um, the uh, high performance structure that we got here. Again, um, fabrication, um, the kind of characteristics of the material system, the structural performance are highly interrelated in the design process. So here we also um, upgraded and further developed our processing unit in a kind of cool design process with what was required for this particular project. But the kind of really important nexus for all these experiments is of course computation because um, you need to design the fabrication process, the engineering methods, and um, the, the design at the same time. Otherwise, you will not be able to, you will simply not be able to make this. Um, so here we uh, had to meet very stringent performance criteria because this is a public building exhibited or sort of positioned, located in a public space. So the safety margin for this was uh, more than four, um, which meant that we had to uh, also go through a full certification process for the entire structure. So um, this is the process that uh, is required to get uh, a building permit in Germany, which meant that uh, serious um, full-scale tests had to be made. Um, and uh, what you can see here is one of those setups um, where we managed to actually load this component. This is one of the components, it's about five meters tall, weighs only 70 to 80 kilograms, but can take, as you can see, see on the left, 25 tons. Um, so that's a serious truck that you could rest on it um, in compression, which of course is the worst case for fibers. Um, what is also important is that here we could now uh, do the research and development at the university, but by then we had the spin out company Fiber, who is now offering these um, uh, um, building services uh, professionally to the building sector. So they built um, all these elements uh, and set them up on site together with us. Um, and here you can see the benefit of an incredibly lightweight structure, which was easily assembled in large prefabricated pieces in a few days. And then at the end, uh, we equipped it with a highly transparent ETFE membrane um, that <coughs> uh, uh, further enhances, I think, this expression of lightweightness. So here you see the final pavilion. Um, and I think, again, it's very interesting to note that it's a kind of space and structure that you probably have never seen or experienced before, certainly not most of the 2 million visitors that actually pass through this building. But still, you can understand um, what, is somewhat, what is somehow going on um, because the expression of this kind of new uh, fibrous tectonics lends themselves to being read um, also uh, for non-experts. So you probably understand that this kind of uh, finely coordinated net of fibers is load bearing where it's dark and dense, while where the uh, uh, kind of uh, glass fibers are, those are primarily the kind of shape making devices, um, which help the carbon fibers to be located exactly where they need to be. Um, but uh, then also <clears throat> allow the um, setup of this uh, super transparent skin. Um, of course, uh, a kind of technical remark is that uh, uh, the lightning protection here was a bit of a challenge because carbon fibers um, actually uh, uh, are not very, <laughs> very conducive to building something with carbon fibers because they can, uh, electricity is running through them. So this is uh, something that we had to tackle alongside. 
But in the end, um, I think it is kind of a celebration um, of what we'd like to call a truly digital um, building system that really takes advantage of um, the design, engineering, but also fabrication technologies that we now have at our disposal. And I think a structure like this would have been impossible to build uh, just a decade ago. So um, with this, um, you can see that this is also something that you can do already today. So there was no, let's say, uh, um, bonus for that being ex experimental structure. It had to meet all the stringent requirements of a German application. And here's a small video that summarizes this project. So one question that we got uh, regularly when we developed all these uh, very lightweight uh, pavilions is um, this is all nice and fine. And um, in the end with the Buga pavilion, we actually arrived at a kind of uh, of seven kilograms per square meter roof, uh, which is really phenomenally lightweight. Probably five, you can build with any comparative seal structure. Um, but still, we always face the question, so how can you build a house with that? Why is it always just a roof? So um, exhibit uh, a major piece at the uh, Venice Biennale this year, we thought we address exactly this question, um, primarily in response to um, also the overarching question of the exhibition, how will we live together, um, which we think material culture also for the domestic spaces or the level of the household where we actually were allocated um, uh, uh, in order to really come up with a kind of future-proof um, attempt of how we actually create habitable spaces um, that uh, provide a totally different level of uh, resource efficiency. So that's what we call it. Um, Maison Fibre, um, you can see this here. Um, and uh, it was the first time that we were able to actually build a two-story uh, structure with these materials. 
to show that this is not limited to roof structures. It's actually a model of how you can build inhabitable spaces in the 21st. Because of that, we also related it to one of the key models of how you build um, domestic spaces in the 20th century, which of course is Corpse Maison Domino. And I think what is crucial is that um, our Maison Fieber is somehow um, trying as a model, you know, more as a question than really a, a, an answer, but ask the question, how can we actually shift from an architectural, uh, uh, let's say, an overwhelming architectural approach or predominant architectural approach that is always based on the solid, the solid slab, the solid column, the solid walls. Um, how can we change to a kind of tectonics of the fibers? Because the solids always use, um, let's say, isotropic materials, which means by concept or conceptually, they are um, less performative and less effective than highly anisotropic materials as fibers. Again, that's the reason why nature built with fibers. So um, I think also we wanted to show how we can use mobile fabrication to do so. So a very compact fabrication unit that should be a lot smaller than the building that we built, that should be mobile, that should be locally deployable, um, as we did in the VNA. Um, we wanted to show how we can actually build reusable elements and because we, of course, use a material that can last for a very long time. So we want to make sure that we can out project. And we also wanted to show how our system can actually interact and adapt to an existing context because of a lot of the buildings we will build in the future, um, especially um, in the developed world, will have to situate themselves within an existing urban fabric. So um, as you can see here, the, the uh, Maison Domino, of course, is the nation with reinforced concrete which weighs around uh, 500 kilograms per square meter for a 200 millimeter slab, while our fiber composite structure weighs only around 10 kilograms. And if you add the walkable surface, which in our case is a um, timber floor uh, to it, then this is another um, 23 kilograms. So it is around 50 times lighter in total um, than the kind of Corbusier's role model for the 20th century. Of course, this uh, a real challenge when it comes to the design, the fabrication, and especially also to the engineering of the structure. Um, again, here, there's not a single piece of steel in the floor or in the cantilevers. Um, we only um, have this interface with the existing column, which are the thin steel structures because the Biennale did not allow us to actually hang our structures on the existing brick work, which they could have easily done. But um, for, let's say, heritage reasons, um, they, they, they were a bit conservative on, conservative on that level. And here you can see the fiber structural model, um, which showcases um, the kind of intricacy of the design um, of how you uh, make this work uh, and the kind of um, various different blade configurations that can all be built with the same principle that you can see here on the right, the principle that we have now used very often. You have the glass fibers as the foam work and the carbon fibers as the load bearing structure, all done with a kind of manufacturing unit, which we in the end actually deployed in Stuttgart. Um, again, because due to various reasons, um, we were not able to produce on site in Venice. Um, what is important to say is that while it is an uh, exhibition, um, everything in the Biennale needs to comply with the Italian building code. So an inhabitable exhibition floor needs to take 3.5 kilonewton per square meter. Um, that's what our structure can actually, or is designed to take, which again meant that there's a very intricate relation um, between the fibers, the timber floor, which is actually a stressed timber plate, um, and how they interact to uh, ensure this um, level of performance, which again had to be um, proven 
So several uh, uh, full-scale tests had to be conducted that showed that actually these elements can be made. Uh, and here you can see the, the flow a lightweight and almost dematerialized um, they appear. Um, so as I mentioned, for some produced them in Stuttgart and then shipped them quite literally um, to Venice. Um, but here you can also see that uh, uh, they're incredibly lightweight. Actually, you can pull. Um, and this is one of my favorite photos where they're fully assembled and you can see this incredibly lightweight incredibly intricate uh, load-bearing structure, which really, I think, uh, makes it very obvious that a tectonics tectonic of the fibers radically differs from a tectonic of solid plates. Um, this is the resulting uh, inhabitable structure. Um, I think it's, it's uh, quite interesting to see how even within this very, let's say, structure, the incredible differentiation of the fibers generates a totally different architectural experience. Um, we designed the structure uh, shape itself around the existing columns in order to show, as I said before, the way that the kind of adaptability to um, a context. Um, and uh, as you can see here, there's also this incredible, uh, uh, I would say, six facade of the underbelly of the floor blades um, where you can look up and you can see the fibers um, celebrating basically the, 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 the appearance of the structure um, as a key feature um, of the architectural um, expression. Um, as I said, it's an inhabitable upper floor. So we provided a stair um, to uh, go up. Um, there was also a very nice situation structure sits in the central uh, corridor of the uh, arsenale so that uh, the, the load-bearing wall, what you can see here on the right is the load-bearing fibrous wall that takes considerable amount of the forces of the upper floor, um, yet looks almost like a dematerialized plate, was really celebrated also from the perspectival, uh, um, let's say, effect that you get through this cascading spaces of the arsenal. So on the upper floor, um, there was also, uh, or there is, um, because this structure is still uh, open on the larger exhibition about um, how we envision this novel material culture of which Maison Fibre is only one, uh, but the key envision um, this um, as a kind of larger project um, and how our research up to now has uh, related to this. So here you can again see um, the existing columns, then the slender steel structure that we had to provide to sit in the same plane as the columns. And then from then on, there's only the fibers that don't touch actually the, <coughs> the, the, the historical structure. Um, um, and uh, I think, uh, it was an, um, absolutely fantastic to see how this actually plays out um, uh, as a kind of house in a house um, and how this also in, in many ways actually changes the perception of the arsenal because you have the very rare opportunity to actually go up, look down and due to design, you can actually see from one side of the fiber structure into the other side of the fiber structure, see people um, passing by and in that way, amplifying um, the experience of those fibrous tectonics. So also a small video about this.
So future perspective to this, um, uh, key, um, I would say aspects for us is to also take this um, into practice. So we're very happy that uh, um, actually two years ago in the summer, a major competition for a research center for textile technologies uh, in uh, Reutlingen, which is a town close to Stuttgart, actually building an entire facade system out of those fibers. So this will go on site in um, uh, uh, next year and completed um, by the end of 2022. So I think it's also fantastic to see how these uh, systems now make their way into architectural practice, which, course, which of course also raises a whole number of additional challenges, um, which were also uh, um, a research perspective. So um, fibers uh, composite of excellence we have a whole number of projects that investigate uh, further such long span load adapted fiber composites with actually embedded fiber uh, sensor networks, for example, that uh, new kind of uh, also AI design methods for these super intricate structures, um, the kind of elaborate form finding mechanical modeling and assessment models that are required. Um, of course, we are further developing the cyber physical prefabrication processes where we look at how we can actually wind these pieces with multi working at the same time. Um, then they're beginning to address the assembly issues by having actually assembly robots that are, uh, because these structures are very, um, I would say, suitable for um, automated autonomous assembly because they're so lightweight. Um, there's a whole let's say research area that, that investigates the data management and the aforementioned artificial intelligent approaches that are required to handle this level of um, complexity. And um, in the end, what is trying to really understand the environmental and technical quality models that relate to these structures, but also uh, the social uh, implications that they may have. Um, so just as a kind of snippet, um, this is uh, one project that uh, looks into uh, self-learning fiber agents for the fiber net generation, uh, enhanced by new visualization techniques. Um, so here we work with uh, a robotics and AI group um, uh, and uh, actually the Center for Visualization uh, together in one project to see how um, we can actually make the design of such complex uh, structures, on the one hand, uh, more uh, effective and performative, but on the other hand, also more accessible to a designer. Um, we're also looking, of course, in increasing the scale and uh, making not only the design, but also the process more intelligent. So we are developing actually um, a number of sensor-driven filament application heads that allow to substantially increase uh, the size of the elements. Um, this is one first iteration um, where you now can actually really have direct sensor feedback with the uh, application fibers. Um, so that, um, of course, this is one critical point to, uh, to define a process that actually regulates itself rather than everything being hard coded into the control. Um, and how this may actually allow you to build really structures that no longer require any uh, internal, let's say, structure, but very simple adaptable frames, as you can see here, um, and in the void between the two uh, emerges the fiber structure, um, just in midair, so to say. Um, one really important facet for us is how we can uh, broaden the palette of materials, because in a sense, this let's say fibrous te uh, tectonics can be materialized uh, in many different ways using different uh, uh, materialities. So um, here on the left, you see the carbon and glass fiber, um, which is the current fibers that we have at our disposal that we of course need to use if we want to get reliable results. But we're now uh, really beginning to research natural fiber systems such as naturally grown fibers, flux and hemp fibers, for example, or um, basalt fibers 
um, which are basically stone fibers, um, which are able to withstand extreme uh, heat and fire. Um, also here we have a, a prototype um, that we will complete actually within the next month, the first natural fiber pavilion uh, that we have built, um, which will be uh, released um, uh, in the second week of July. And this will be a major step forward for us to show that we can work away from the kind of petrochemically based carbon fibers towards uh, naturally grown fibers, which of course opens uh, a whole new world of possibilities um, for those systems. So I would like to conclude um, by uh, presenting very briefly the last case study, um, which kind of comes full circle because it again looks at wood and it also comes full circle by because here um, we have a, a, a truly high level of integration because we no longer even consider the fabrication process being separate material, but the fabrication process being somehow embedded into the material so that it only needs to be steered and controlled to a level of through a level of material programming. Um, as we know, wood is a fairly complex material. It's also a fibrous material, by the way, made from cellulose fibers that are embedded in a matrix of uh, uh, hemicellulose and uh, especially lignin. And uh, wood has the tendency to actually change its shape um, when it uh, absorbs moisture. So um, usually we consider this kind of shape change as a deformation and as a kind of defect in many ways uh, or problem. So there are many ways uh, of how you classify the problem. Uh, you have uh, boards that cup or twist or bow. Um, and we have uh, many thousand years of graph from happening. Um, and there's a whole, let's say, uh, textbook, uh, encyclopedic textbook knowledge of how you work uh, with the material to suppress that inherent um, behavior. So we tried to say, why, why don't we utilize this behavior? Why don't we actually um, employ it in the process of changing shape? Um, and again, nature is a fantastic example um, of how you can do this. Um, even this sort of simple spruce cone that we all know that you can see here, and that's exactly that. It grows on the tree uh, in a moist state, as you can see here on the left, then it falls off the tree. And actually without any further operational energy invested, it changes the shape in a nicely choreographed manner. Um, and it does so by embedding, um, let's say, all the uh, uh, information that is required to execute that shape change into the material. So there's a stimulus, which is the input, which is a change of relative humidity, which means there's a change of moisture content in the scale of the pine cone, which then triggers um, a dimensional change, which the pine cone through the architecture of its fibers translates into shape change um, that results in the opening. I think it's really interesting and initially we are fascinated by this because it's a kind of motion that does not require any motor or any muscles. So it is a kind of uh, uh, motion that uh, um, does not require operational energy. So um, we have been conducting for more than a decade now a research on how we can utilize this for, um, let's say, building skins that can uh, be ecologically embedded into um, a particular local situation. And uh, we have advanced this actually to the point that we can now have these uh, uh, wood veneer elements that uh, change shape also in a very nicely choreographed manner um, with uh, changes of the weather, which means changes of relative humidity. So you can imagine um, this is a building skin that opens if the weather is nice and the sun shines and closes automatically um, if rain approaches. 
um, and the relative humidity rises. But um, what is interesting is that, uh, again, um, while this, of course, offers a whole new, uh, I would say, paradigm of how you think about adaptive structures, uh, what is interesting is that um, we were very often questioned um, why we do this, because uh, it is a non-scalable process. Yeah? So somehow there's this obsession with scaling up in architecture. Here, I would argue, if you talk about building skins, you would really want to scale down and make these flaps smaller and more agile. This is something we're working on now, actually by 3D printing the timber material, rather than just using the uh, uh, rotary cut veneer. Um, but um, that you can scale that phenomenon is something that we investigated uh, over the last few years um, and that it works, you can see very nicely here. So this is now a timber plate uh, where you have a passive layer that is around 10 millimeters thick and an active layer that is 30 millimeters thick. So this plate up here is 40 millimeters thick, substantial thickness, uh, and it still changes its shape um, based on the wood moisture content um, in relation um, to let's say the swelling and the shrinking of the active layer. So in order to then program a piece of wood to do the shape change that you are sort of interested in uh, it to perform, um, you need to have uh, fairly advanced computational models. This is something that we worked on together with colleagues from the ETH Zurich. Here's one uh, just to give you an idea uh, about the. Uh, um, the kind of predictive models that uh, uh, were developed for uh, both hardwood, such as European beech, and softwood, for which it actually works a bit better. Norway spruce, and um, that were also uh, published in pretty renowned uh, journals. But the real challenge is how you actually make this super complex computation model um, lightweight enough to embed it into the, uh, a kind of workflow that is in tune with the parameters that you actually get in a regular wood processing um, chain, um, which are fairly restricted. So here you can see that the fun, this is the fundamental prerequisite to build pretty substantial pieces. So you can, in the end, uh, build mass timber plates, uh, cross laminated timber beams, or plates that self-shape into the curvature that um, you actually program into the material. How that works is something that um, I would like to show you on this last uh, project, um, the Obach Tower that we completed uh, for the Landesgarten Show in 2019. This was a collaborative project, again, with uh, our partners from ITKE, Young Knippers, but also with the colleagues from the uh, laboratory of cellulose and wood um, at Empire in Zurich and wood material science at the ETH um, and the industry partner Pluma Lehmann. Um, and I think it's a uh, it's fantastic to actually have industry partners that are ready to venture uh, on such an uh, um, adventurous path. Um, so um, this this is also an important uh, aspect um, to being able to conduct this kind of research. So, of course, what you need in order to design a structure like that is a design tool that uh, captures the possibilities and the achievable radii um, uh, with this kind of safe shaping process. This is what we uh, developed uh, for um, this structure that we have now at our disposal, um, which interfaces with the, um, let's say, structural engineering model so that it can also see um, and utilize the, let's say, corrugation, the three-dimensional corrugation that you get um, to enhance the performance of the structure. In the end here, we have a 14 millimeter tower, 14 meter tall tower that can be constructed with self-shaped CLT that is only 90 um, millimeters strong. Um, so we, again, use only local wood, um, actually trees from Switzerland that are processed in exactly the same manner as all uh, wood is processed in a sort of modern sawmill. So all pieces are actually sorted according to the mo uh, moisture content, but also to the um, grain direction. Um, and then we laminate these bilayers layers together, put them in the shelves that you can see here, 
and then they're actually dried in the same oven as all the other timber is dried. So it's the same process uh, and the timber manufacturer would never ever run one drying cycle just for us. So it had to work in the context of the many cubic meters of wood that needed to be um, processed at the same time. And then in the oven, uh, which is impossible to actually capture with the film, um, this happens, uh, the, the wood undergoes a kind of uh, dries out, um, the wood moisture content is lowered from 22% to 12% and the predicted shape change takes place, which means that you get these really uh, complex uh, elements um, that are made from two of those bilayers that are glued together and that are actually glued onto a third very thin layer that uh, then also locks um, the elements uh, in the particular shape um, that was programmed. So the whole tower um, was prefabricated in four quarters in Switzerland, um, also equipped, of course, with the water barrier and an external cladding, and then came to site um, and was set up actually in half a day. Uh, again, this was a kind of millimeter precision. And here in this image, you get um, just before the last quarter is installed, um, you get an idea of the thinness of the structure, which is also enabled um, by this complex three-dimensional um, corrugation of the tower. So I think um, it's a, somehow a great project because it shows how an integrative approach and approach that really looks at a higher level of integration through what we like to call co-design can tease out um, even uh, for such a traditional material as wood, a, a kind of novel um, set of possibilities that here also result in, um, I think, or are expressed architecturally. Um, of course, uh, one of the important uh, things that we had to ensure is that the tower um, once it is shaped, it doesn't change back. So we're monitoring this with laser scanning and we are quite uh, proud to report that the concrete there is actually showing more deformations as a process of settling than our tower. So I think uh, we can say that um, the self shaping manufacturing has actually um, become, or is no longer, let's say uh, an academic dream, but it has become an actually constructible reality, which performs with quite a high level of reliability and precision. And this tower, by the way, is also a permanent structure. But it also generates, um, I think, uh, new uh, aesthetic possibilities for timber. So on the outside, you have this very um, crisp edges um, that accentuate the complex shape of the elements, while on the inside, um, you have the uh, very smooth um, convex curvature of the blades, which lend almost a textile-like experience um, to the timber structure, which is, I think, even more accentuated by the light washing down the tower walls um, that uh, uh, with the light coming in through a transparent uh, skylight that sits on top of the tower. So um, it opens like a curtain um, towards the valley, um, celebrates, I think, uh, the way it sort of interacts with nature and does that, I think, in a very appropriate manner by actually looking at the natural material and how through computation, um, we can really um, uh, sort of find novel possibilities um, uh, in the materials um, that we have at our disposal, how we can construct something that is a very effective structure, but at the same time, um, a very um, expressive architecture and all that by minimizing our footprint on the planet using primarily renewable materials um, and that in a kind of uh, resource effective manner. So with that, uh, I would like to come to an end. Um, I think Neil and uh, Philip gave me 120 minutes. So I think it's also time to conclude, um, but I'm now looking forward to a discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for the fantastic um, lecture. 
So it's it's really impressive um, for the whole process. Actually, although I, I I know all the project, maybe most of the project very well, but still every time uh, this an uh, arcing lecture will give different kind of uh, thinking and inspiration for our research. Uh, so we have actually a lot of questions, but um, maybe I put forward some of them firstly, and then some question from Paul. I think it's not easy, uh, although uh, we know each other for a long time, and uh, to set up a special team. It's like a special army working for you for a very long time. Uh, I remember seven, eight years ago, you're starting from a really uh, small pavilion, but it's all the way goes to a bigger scale and larger and larger and to the architect scale right now, especially I think this time in Venice Bianetti, the project is very impressive, very impressive. Um, and not only the details, but also a systematic, uh, your name is like uh, integrate design skills is, is in, uh, incredibly make improvement. It's like a different version update so quick um, in the past few years. So I think uh, the first thing I want to ask um, uh, maybe some questions also from Paul, uh, how um, do you organize this kind of process I think it's not easy. Uh, normally we want to do something good, but um, we have different teams and how to set up like different teams working together. And this is the first. The second thing about the, the budget. You no, know, <laughs> sometimes you want to make a very elegant, uh, high standard uh, pavilion. It's, it's, it's always difficult to find uh, enough funding to do that. I think uh, Akim is not only a good designer, but also a very good organizer. To, 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 to very uh, fluently uh, make all the things extremely good, the best in the world. I think uh, the question maybe firstly, could you um, make an introduction, maybe not about the design process, but about the, how you organize, operate your team uh, 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 briefly, maybe <laughs> to all of us, we're curious on that, yeah. I think it's a uh, it's a key question, no? Because uh, <laughs> the team the team is, I mean, what I need to say is I'm I'm the presenter, yeah. But uh, of course, the, the the people who actually uh, have to take all the credits is the team. Yeah? And um, I think uh, it's a question that I thought for now because the team has increased uh, tremendously in size. So we're now, I mean, ICD started with two people. Then uh, now um, we're about 30. And in the cluster of excellence, we are more than 120 researchers mm -hmm. from architecture, civil engineering, robotics, computer engineering, all the ways to social science uh, uh, and humanities. And of course, is how you facilitate, uh, let's say, a research culture where there's I, I would say a mutual appreciation and especially understanding of what you want to achieve. And I think um, there are two, I mean, my, in my eyes is, is uh, two things are imp important. No? So one is that um, in this kind of interdisciplinary settings, every discipline needs to be, I would say of the same uh, value and think um, as the others and I think they all need to also be able to make their own discoveries yeah I think it usually very quickly goes wrong if the architects think they can just rope in some computer science uh, to do what they want to do that that never works out in my eyes I think it it only works out if the computer scientists also have their genuine research insights um, and then I think it's really about how do you um uh, uh, how, let's say uh, the team in a way that uh, that there's a joint goal, no? And I think the the what we like to call the pavilions or the demonstrators—that's how we call them nowadays. Or let's say, the, I mean, they're not really the research. The research are all the projects that we do, the research projects that we do in order to build these projects. But the vehicle to really get the team together. To have a joint vision, that these are the these are the, the architectural projects. So um, I think that uh, uh, that is that is, that is really really important. And I think um, we have a lot of people that 
um, that 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 are beginning to also appreciate this. Uh, um, but it's, it's it's a hell lot of work. That's that's what it is. Okay. And, and 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 not just I mean I, not a hell lot of work for me. It's a hell lot of work for everyone because it's an extra effort. If you want to do these kind of projects and if you want to work in an interdisciplinary situation, you step out of your comfort zone. So um, you need to be have an extra level of ambition. Every every single one of the researchers that we work with. Yes, that's very German style so everything is so well organized <laughs> so that's 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 unique i think uh, in architect discipline so we have a lot of questions uh, one of them a uh, student is asking if you he want to be a student of you what kind of skills um would you like to take in consideration how do you make selections of the phd student <laughs> okay Okay, uh, I think we usually we don't uh, need these and these skills. We ask what kind of skills do you have, mm -hmm. uh, and then we check whether you are ready to work in the team. So we don't have a pre pre. I, I think we have a certain level that you need to have in order to be able to communicate. But I think we have people that are stronger, let's say, from a, a constructive point of view, stronger from a coding point of view. It, it really depends on your background. I mean, I think the, what we have found is that now uh, we nurture a lot of talent in-house because um, we have people joining us. And uh, in the master's program, we lay the foundations when it comes to the hard skills that we need to, uh, that we like to see in the kind of PhD, in our, for our PhD researchers. But I think there's not a, I would say there's not a kind of, a preset profile that you need to meet. Um, we're quite quite open, but we're quite open, but we also tend to accept the best. <laughs> good, good. Neil, would you like to uh, ask some question? Yeah, uh, for, first of all, I can thank you. That was really a stunning lecture. I mean, beautiful, so clear. And uh, and it actually, it's validating what, what, what Philip and I are thinking about this possibility of setting up a platform where everyone can really partake of something and really Get, uh, he, get lectures from the very best in the world on a single platform. So it was really stunning. Um, uh, I, I'm interested in the question of AI, but maybe I'll ask that question later. But I just wanted, there's one small thing that came up, which is I was intrigued by um, you. Uh, you mentioned the acoustic performance of your um, book, uh, Wood Pavilion, uh, and referred to this example in Isfahan. But was it accidental? I mean, the, the acoustic performance, or did you um, did you actually model it in some way? Um, Quite frankly, we it was it was intentional, but it was accidentally good. <laughs> so we did. Uh, I mean, you have to imagine. No, we we literally. Um, and by the way, Philip, every project that we do is actually a low budget project in the end. No? So um, that uh, I think we are we are also. A lot of the ideas that and I'm, I'm not deviating from your question. I come back, Neil, but it's important to say that those are actually uh, uh, publicly, typically publicly funded um, projects which run on low budgets um, and have a very strict timeline. Yeah, where if a booger opens and uh, the president of Germany comes on that day, it needs to be done, um, and it needs to it it has to be in the budget. There's no way you can go beyond the budget. So, um, which we actually managed because we worked together with the, the industry from day one. I think that's what we are also missing in the industry. Huh? So, at least in Central Europe. But it, so, the Neil, your your question is: I think we had an understanding that if we have, we knew that we cannot do, um, uh, let's say, a con convex shell with or a thin plastic shell with planar faces on the inside, because then you get really horrible sound concentration. So there was the intention to address this geometrically. How well this worked out was not anticipated. I mean, the, the, the German equivalent of BBC actually hosted their Pentecost um, mass actually in, in, that, in the pavilion. Yeah, so that has the highest TV show acoustic requirements. 
output, which was actually really a surprise for us because a lot of people told us it's impossible actually for lightweight structure with a sink elastic surface to actually achieve that. Um, in the end, we didn't even have time to just to model it properly. Uh, we were running by um, uh, basically that, that assumption, but it worked out beautifully. And, and the comparison to Isfahan, of course, works because also the, the depth of the structure in the music chamber is actually very, very similar. And it's exactly the same principle. Um, and we're now also looking in how we can actually integrate that into the cassette uh, so that we can add an additional acoustic layer, which at the same time is the is also the insulation. Uh, typically, we, we divide insulation from acoustic insulation, and we want to combine it. And for that, this timber system is perfect. Can I just throw in something that there was something I was, this is years ago, I was looking at Vitruvius, and he has this thing in the recesses under the seats in the amphitheater, they used to have these amphora, and they would have water, and they would, the level of the water would be carefully monitored and things. And whenever I try to find out the acoustic um, uh, research, no, nobody could understand it, and they all dismissed it, but I'm sure there's something there. So maybe next time round, but it was, uh, anyway, thank you. It was a beautiful, beautiful lecture. Thank you. Yeah, I hope we have one more student uh, from before and um, is asking about uh, the, when you make the, the fiber project, uh, it's uh, extremely important to pre-saturate with resin. So, and the question goes to all structure carbon, carbon fibers uh, when uh, you win, uh, won, won them, the same tension um, period to baking. So uh, how do you uh, make research on this kind of the performance of bait, a resin? Because sometimes um, uh, under sunshine and the resin will have different kind of uh, material performance uh, to carbon fiber and uh, glass fiber. Do you, do you have any um, special research or further uh, introduction on your research uh, of resin on your project? It's a really, it's a really good question, and uh, tells me that we have a very informed audience, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, expert audience. Um, so I think there are two uh, two sides to it. I mean, the the Buga pavilion, the dome-like uh, structure, that um, as part of the building permit process had to show that it can take eighty continuously eighty um, degrees centigrade. It's basically what you get if you have sunlight, direct sunlight on a black carbon fiber. Um, so that's what uh, the, the structure had to be able to take. And um, that is possible with the resin systems, the commercially available resin systems, um, if you cure them at around the same temperature. So that's what we always have to do. And then of course, as you nicely point out in the question, one of the really important aspects is that the uh, fibers are evenly saturated uh, so that they are stable in the curing process. And that is something where we are now, I showed one example is this now the new fiber application head. And that head actually monitors, has a kind of sensor at the front that monitors the fiber saturation. So we get a data set for every millimeter of fiber that's laid with the fiber saturation and we now have automated fiber applications, so you can actually, there's not only a break in the fiber, but we, you can unwind it, sort of you can pull it back so that we get constant fiber tension every time. That was actually one of the biggest problems we always had is that you, with the robot, you have to turn that change direction. And of course, then you lose all tension in the fiber. And we now, and if you look, some of our very recent publications in some special composite journals uh, are explaining this very, we, we just actually had a, also had a, um, a publication in, um, in a special issue on additive manufacturing for construction, which was released, I think today, um, where this process of uh, tension monitoring, fiber saturation monitoring, all in this custom uh, placement head is, is described. It's a critical step. For us, actually, the, 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 the main incentive is that um, we want to uh, get away from a kind of a safety factor of four. Yeah, you have to imagine the Buga Pavilion could have been four times lighter if there wouldn't have been a safety factor of four. It's just that the proof engineer is so feel, feels so unsecure about the whole thing and says, ah, oh, this could be so much wrong. I mean, they, we had to send them 
computer tomography images of the cut fibers to verify the saturation. Yeah? Uh, tens, dozens and dozens of uh, CT samples and everything, and still safety margin uh, or safety factor four. So if we just manage to enhance the uh, quality assurance, we can, and we get, we can half that, we have doubled the efficiency of, I mean, the performance of the system. And that's, yeah. uh, that's, 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 that's the key. So I think it's a very, very, very good question. I think we can find a lot of performance actually in the quality assurance rather than in sort of developing entire new, new things mm -hmm. for these kind of systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's extremely detailed and the important question to the fiber living technology. So it's, it's a really good question. And at the same time, Gustavo, would you like to give uh, your answer, uh, your, your question to, to Ahim? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for the wonderful, inspired talk. I, I think, uh, thank you for the detailed question on the fibers. That was really uh, fascinating. But my question comes to, uh, to this. What do you think the role is of artificial intelligence and intelligent materials, as in informational? How do you see that pipeline influencing your future research? I start with the last part, and then I go to the AI part. Um, I think the... I would say we are still uh, absolutely amazed by how much intelligence you can find even in such a kind of commonplace material such as wood, no? I mean, it, it's a material that literally is, uh, I think it's uh, uh, an abundant uh, material available anywhere, almost anywhere on the planet. And, and, and yet, if you, if you kind of, have a different kind of uh, uh, um, model for dealing with it, I would say. Um, you can program it to actually perform uh, fairly intelligent behaviors. Um, of course, the next, the next uh, step is how you augment those kinds of materials with further layers of um, intelligence. And I think this is what we're doing um, by, I think I alluded to that in the talk, um, by now we have, and this is what one of our workshops, actually one of our digital futures workshops that Yazi and Tiffany and Dylan are running um, is about is how you can 3D print these structures. Yeah, also using natural materials. Um, so bio-based bio, bio -based materials. Um, and of course, once you are in additive manufacturing, you can begin to mix these kind of passive levels of material programming and active levels of material programming. They have a very nice uh, um, joint uh, exchange with MIT that is about smarter, smart materials. Yeah? So actually, that's it's about the balance between sort of traditional, in quotation marks, traditional understanding of smart materials, which is sort of they are all active and adaptive, and out and and actually augmenting that with passive um, uh, behaviors and passive uh, uh, actuation. And combining these two, I think that is what is really, really interesting. No? Um, turns out that a lot of the passive mechanisms are um, more difficult to control, require a lot more, let's say, sophistication than, than the active ones. That's the second, the answer to the second part of the question. It's also a really good question. When it comes to AI, I think um, we are employing a lot of uh, um, machine learning nowadays and artificial intelligence approaches because we now have, um, let's say, the, uh, uh, also a lot of really good collaboration with uh, people from robotics and computer science. Um, our cluster of excellence is actually part of the so-called Cyber Valley, which is Europe's biggest um, AI research center. And uh, our key collaborator actually in the cluster of excellence is the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. So they that's their core core part but the really um, interesting question is um, um, employ these uh, new methods hmm? so I think there are I think there's a lot of scope let's say for um, let's say data driven simulations for example um, so the timber we are now launching a, a new timber project which looks not at the 120 parameter physics-based model 
but it's actually based on sampling. So um, uh, you can take basically, uh, uh, at, uh, um, let's say, advantage of the fact that the, the, the training is actually very, very fast because uh, all the pieces are there and also the, 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 the elements can be very rapidly made, they can be very rapidly monitored. We have all the kind of actuation uh, mechanisms there and this, this is one approach. And then, of course, the other um, uh, facet, or the, we have three things where we look into AI. One is that, not data integrated simulation. Um, second facet is sort of, uh, or, um, let's say, this, uh, where we integrate them into design methods. Um, there we have actually really interesting results when it comes to the carbon fiber nets, uh, the fiber nets. Yeah? The fiber nets are so damn difficult to control or actually to model. Um, in, in a conventional manners that we have a, a project with um, um, actually three people from computer science that just looks at uh, how we can uh, generate valid, what we call fiber syntheses. So synt a syntax is only a description how, you, how the fiber goes from one point to the other point. And even if you have only 15 points on both ends, there's an incredible design space how you can actually go through them uh, if you give a sequence. In the end, you only need that address code, no? How and how you connect what point when in that sequence. And um, to derive valid syntheses is a fantastic sort of uh, possibility for, there is a fantastic possibility to actually um, also imply. Showed you this one example with the reinforcement learning um, for the fiber, net in the Buga setup. Huh? So the idea is to go beyond these kind of tubular structures, which are intuition based to find completely new kinds of fibrous elements um, that we cannot even think of. Huh? That is actually really a methodological challenge because it tends, of course, also the, all these approaches tend to also just replicate what you know rather than generate something new. So there's a, a bit of sophistication required here. The last uh, uh, area we have where we employ, um, um, let's say, AI methods is um, in uh, the task and motion planning. Um, so if you have really distributed systems, uh, so we now uh, have actually quite a number of projects that look into distributed robotics, parallel construction. Um, uh, the last thing you want, I mean, it's impossible to actually coordinate them. Um, and uh, here, what is, ah, sorry, the most important thing I forgot to, uh, is to mention how we do this for the fiber nets. So the fiber nets is also an agent-based model. And because we now have 10 years of agent-based modeling experience, what we do is we actually uh, uh, try to um, basically train the agents uh, to come up with intelligent agent behavior. That is the key. Yeah? So what we really try to do is to, to, to allow the agents to learn. Um, and that's how the fiber nets are actually uh, done. And then the next step, and that's why I had to go back to, the, to this previous part, is that we are looking into how the agents become physical agents, not just design agents, but physical agents, like these small robots that I showed you, which are actually almost primitive machines with one, just one, one axis rotation. But in their combination, they can do all kinds of degrees of freedom. So once the agent becomes a physical agent, you are into a totally different domain of uh, task and motion planning problems. And um, of course, there's also a lot out there how you can uh, use AI approaches to that. Um, but it's interesting that our particular, let's say, uh, uh, I'm almost have to say our particular applications challenge also some of the methods that are usually um, deployed in robotics. And um, that's, that's a fantastic ground for truly interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research. And the goal here is to say, um, in the end, we need the intelligence in the uh, fabrication agent. And the last thing we really want to um, do is we want to describe what, what is supposed to be built. No? Sort of, we want to give a performance goal and then how we get there is something that can be actually based on a learned behaviors. Great.
sorry for the long-winded uh, answer, yeah. but uh, <laughs> uh, actually, because the background is a uh, new, actually organized two um, actual series on artificial intelligence, so that's why a lot of questions goes through there. I also found maybe in your group you also have some new faces um, who make research on the AI uh, as a professorship or not. Uh, I, I I noticed. Yeah. You have, yeah. We established, we established at ICD, we established a second professorship that just looks at AI and machine learning as, um, and we're very happy that we got Thomas Wortman uh, to join us uh, half a year ago, um, who's really uh, a world expert, and he's actually also an expert in high performance systems, huh? so right. he actually won mathematical competitions. Uh, in showing how his his actually methods can compete on the highest level when it comes to performance, um, but I think that's that's uh, I think you are completely on the right track. That's a really important facet uh, and uh, probably the, the, the uh, a really important uh, area of research for the next years. And uh, we try to do this justice with this uh, new professorship. Yeah. Great, great. So thanks a lot. Um, it's very late, uh, already middle night here in, in Shanghai. And thanks a lot for Ahim. Uh, uh, this year, actually, the workshop is quite uh, amazing because we have more than 104 uh, workshops globally and the more people participate. And uh, you and me, we were collaborating, teaching the workshop in uh, Shanghai. Uh, we're looking forward to some uh, the physical pavilions coming out. So, uh, let's meet several days later. So great thanks for your support, for your great lecture. So um, that's um, um, uh, it's tonight. So uh, say bye-bye to you. Ciao, ciao. Thanks a lot. And uh, thanks to Philip and, and Neil, but also thanks to the, to the students who attended. I think they're super interesting questions and a very, very good uh, conversation. So I'm, I'm happy that I could contribute something. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, Akim, and thank you also the, for ICD contributing to the uh, the workshop. Fantastic! Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye <laughs> bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.